All right, hello and welcome. Jesse Canone here from Live Pain Free and I'm happy to have uh, Dr. Zach Bush joining me. Uh, Dr. Bush is a physician specializing in internal medicine, endocrinology, hospice care. Uh, he's an internationally recognized educator and a thought leader on the microbiome. Uh, and for anybody who's not familiar with that is, that is the gut health system uh, that uh, has a massive impact on our overall uh, well-being and uh, something we're learning more about in more recent years. Uh, and so he's gonna be talking to us about how that affects our health, our immunity, and uh, also our uh, potential for chronic pain and disease. Um, so Dr. Bush, thank you so much for joining me. Glad to be with you, Jesse, and as well as the audience. Yeah, so actually I wanted to ask you, and I forgot to ask this before we started, uh, do, you, uh, do you prefer to go by Dr. Zach or Dr. Bush? Uh, you can call me just Zach, it's fine. I'm good Zach, with that. Okay, okay <laughs> cool. Well, um, I forget exactly how I first came across your work, but I believe it was uh, somebody else had interviewed you. And right away, I was like, wow, I really want to connect with this guy. I can tell this guy um, not only is knowledgeable in numerous areas in regard to health, but right away, I could tell that you had a consciousness in your approach that is generally lacking in lots of people, even highly educated people, you know, people who've been studying various aspects of health uh, for 40, 50 years, it's not always present. And so right away, I was like, oh, this is very refreshing. And uh, so uh, I appreciate I appreciate who you are and uh, the work that you're doing very much. And I'm happy to have you here. Awesome. Thank you, Jesse. I'm glad to be here with you. Yeah. So um, like I said uh, a moment ago, the, the microbiome is something that um, many people are not familiar with. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert. Uh, while I've interviewed other people uh, over the years on it, I've learned a bit, but um, can you kind of give us like uh, just a really high level, of, like what is it and what role does it play in, you know, our overall health and well-being? Yeah, the microbiome has been you know, arguably the biggest revolution in science in human history. Uh, the reason is kind of remarkable in that, you know, we can harken back to maybe 2000 years ago when a scientist named Pythagoras in, in ancient Greece uh, came up with a revolutionary mathematics that demonstrated unequivocally that the earth was not flat and that we actually had a, a, a spherical planet. And this was extremely disruptive, you know, and it took thousands of years, you know, for this to really be adopted widely and all the way to the tune of today, 2000 years later, we still right. have a flat earth society. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a very jarring thing when you come up with a science that revolutionizes the idea of who we are, where we are, what we're here to do, whatever it is. And I would say, you know, 1600 years later, the next massive revolution happened with Galileo and his colleagues in the 1600s. In that first decade of the 1600s, uh, you see the invention of the telescope and suddenly, a revolutionary new idea comes in, which is Earth is not at the center of the solar system, let alone the galaxy, right. let alone the, the universe. Right. And that shook not just science, but it shook our religious worldview of maybe we're not the highest, you know, life form or creation of God. And we were somehow a little pixel in the vast, you know, expanse of space. And it immediately started to beg the question of, our, is there other life on on the solar system or in the universe and it's just been a you know very difficult journey i think for religion and science to struggle with the idea of we might be vastly insignificant yeah. <laughs> on the scale of life within the universe before you go any, i was just gonna say before you go any deeper i was just gonna uh i wanted to emphasize something that you kind of started with which is the disruption and i think it's important because um so, so often, as you said, people have a difficult time accepting uh, things that they either can't understand or seem foreign to them uh, or seem impossible, that things they can't see, just like, um, you know, energy people, you know, a lot of people don't believe there's energy. It's just your physical body, right? And uh, so I wanted to emphasize that because right now we're in, as, as you know, we're in a period in history where there's so much division um, and, there's so much talk of conspiracy theories. And uh, what I wanted to just kind of point out is that, as you said, every truth goes through these stages where first it's like violently, you know, uh, rejected and the person's criticized, maybe killed, tortured, lock, locked away. Yep. Galileo, I think, spent the last 10 or more years of his life 
uh, in house arrest, right? Yeah. Um, and so I wanna emphasize that now just to kind of remind everybody that not everything that we believe we know to be true is true and to kind of keep an open mind and, um, and not be so attached. People get so attached to their beliefs that they have a difficult time growing and changing and evolving because they have such a strong level of attachment. And uh, I think now more than ever, that's definitely needed to help people kind of shift and grow and discover more truth than, um, than, they, might, uh, than they might have before, you know? It's a really good point. Yeah, and, and I think that you can, you know, kind of point to the concept of dogma, you know, uh, when dogma is actually very reassuring to the human mind, you know, one right. thing that is inevitable in life, of course, is change. And yet it's the one thing we most resist because we don't want to go through the grief process of losing what we thought was the reality or what we held on to before. And then we lose that. And so we're in a constant grief process throughout life if we're going to acknowledge the existence of change right. um, and, and if we're going to be present enough to recognize change a lot of us don't want to be present enough to recognize change because we don't want to go through the grief process. And so then we create dogma and we say, you know, for a thousand years, we've all agreed that this is the way it is. And this it doesn't change because this is the truth, you know? And so there's a tendency for the human brain to be drawn towards dogma for its lack of change, you know? So we're, we're comforted by the idea of like, we could sit here in this comfortable space of knowing this and not expect any change. And so that's how you end up with something like religious dogma or scientific dogma, I think, is this part of the human brain that seeks control or seeks, you know, a sense of stability and safety, yeah. which is not how the universe works. The universe right. is constantly in transformation. We, the universe loves to do death for the purpose of greater life, you know, and so we forget to die to ourselves every day and we try to stay in this rigid aspect of of control and that leads to more and more friction within the physiology of your body and then leads to things like chronic pain syndromes yeah. and so when we find ourselves in pain we can bet that we have created friction between the flow state and our our daily reality yeah, and that's so cool. that's a good thing to kind of keep in mind of like if you feel pain at the psychosocial spiritual level it's because you're resisting the change that is inevitable as we come into the flow state with the universe. And so that's, that's a framework that I've started to use extensively in clinic is that when I see a patient with breast cancer or I see a patient with chronic low back pain, both of those I know are expressing to me a, a recalcitrant area of their body that refuses to allow them to transform into who they should be today so they can be in their flow state. And so really, it's whether it's the breast cancer is that you immediately move towards a grief resolution process, which is what are you holding on to that creates the friction that would then lead to the, the, the disorder. And that's yeah. a, that's an exciting breakthrough because it helps free up immediately uh, the, the sense of a problem and more, there's just a sense of opportunity, like, Oh, everybody has glimpsed flow state, whether it's because they watch the Olympics and they watch, an amazing athlete get into the flow state or because they went on a 13 mile run at some point in their life and they felt right. that runner's high and they felt that flow state happen or they wrote a piece of poetry or a piece of music and got into that totally creative flow state in that space so we can touch that flow state in many many aspects and uh, we're also very capable of resisting that in in exchange for the comfort of knowing what's going to happen tomorrow yeah, so, so well said. And if you think too about the, um, like I mentioned earlier, the things we can't see. And so because people can't see, they can't understand that we are very holistic beings. And so what you're talking about, about how um, unre unresolved, unreleased um, emotional trauma, spiritual, like you said, um, trauma, if you will, uh, gets held in the body and manifests in numerous ways. And so it's just a, a you know, it's just a good reminder about how holistic we are and uh, how important it is to, to be aware of that and not view yourself as, like my one friend says, a meat spaceship. Uh, you know, like, you know, how a lot, of, a lot of people view the body as just this physical thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you know, what you just shared. Uh, so bringing it back then, coming back to kind of your definition of the microbiome and 
what role does it play in all of the, you know the being? Yeah, so that's the this current revolution we're in. So you know, Galileo says Earth's not at the center of the universe. In 2005, 2010, as we started to improve our technologies of genetic sequencing, we suddenly realized that our body was teeming with microbiome all over the place. We found out that there's microbiome in the human breast and that microbiome is damaged before there occurs breast cancer. There's microbiome, bacteria, fungi, and these living organisms that live in your cerebral spinal fluid around your brain. And, and so we had, up until that moment, believed a paradigm in which we believed that the human immune system sterilized the human body from any outside life. And right. we, were, we were the center of human physiology and human life only happened if you beat back nature far enough that we could be here. Right. Suddenly genetics and the genomic sequencing welcomed and ushered in this whole new reality that said that the human cell is not at the center of human life, just as planet earth is not in the center of the universe. And this was so devastating to our previous belief because we had been convinced that the DNA that we received from mom and dad was what determined the physical state of our body, what diseases we might be prone to, what vulnerabilities, what strengths we had. And to find out that no, it's actually constantly in motion. The body that you build today is the result not of the genetics of mom and dad so much as this massive genetic input that you're getting in real time from this extraordinary ecosystem of 30,000 species of bacteria maybe half a million species of, of fungi. Like it's just like this vast ecosystem within you and around you on your skin and the air you breathe and the water you touch, the food you consume, massive sea of information. And that's just in the microbiome, which is the living organisms, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, uh, all of these single celled organisms, parasites. Then you get to the virome, which is not part of the microbiome, often miscategorized within the microbiome, but the virome is a separate thing. Uh, micro and biomes means small living organisms. The viruses are not living organisms. Viruses are just packets of genetic information that are looking for two phenomena, and they, they create the capacity at, in all of biology on the planet for adaptation and biodiversity. And so the virome was literally created to do gain of function to achieve constant adaptation and constant biodiversification of life on the planet. And so that's the reality that we live within now with the microbiome being like this base of life that microbiome is 90% of the work in the human body. If you go to a health food store, they're going to tell you, well, you need this detox program for a month because your human cells need the enzymes cranked up and you need to take these pancreatic enzymes for digestion. You get this impression that the human body is doing all of the work but it's, it couldn't be further from the truth. 90% of the work done in your body in any organ system is being provided for by the bacteria and fungi that are there nurse mating the human cells into their potential. Without yeah. the living garden within you, you are failing to, to live in your organic, you know, connected, nutrient dense, you know, nutritive state of, of biology. And so that's, been really disrupted with science on so many levels, but I would say, you know, our idea of DNA and genetics has been most disrupted. But the second behind that is the concept of the immune system. If the immune system is not sterilizing your body, then what the hell is it doing? And we right. really need to lose the concept of a human immune system, because in fact, all an immune system is, is a relationship between many species. And so an immune system is a global phenomenon. So when we see pandemics, we can be sure that we didn't do something directly to the human. We did something directly to the planet and all of biology is starting to suffer in its ability to create this homeostasis or balance between life organisms, different species on the planet. When we see imbalance, we can be convinced that we should immediately run to the root cause and say, what did we do to throw off the balance of life on earth? And what have we done is pretty quickly identified in the case of this pandemic, we screwed up air quality in China, we screwed up the microbiome as it survived because of the massive amount of antibiotics poured into the pork industry that is the global pork industry is, is focused in Hunan province where the pandemic began. It's also the highest amounts of PM 2.5 carbon particulate air pollution that carries the virus. Like it was the perfect brewing zone for imbalance to occur. Also, and then the, we watch uh, that track across the world, and, and we can just say we find hot spots of instability in what, what I would call the global immune system. 
I was just going to add, I don't know how much of a factor this was, and maybe we don't even know yet, but um, from my understanding, Wuhan was the first city in China and maybe in the world as well to have a full rollout of 5G technology as well. Yeah, I think that got probably a little bit more press than it needed because they were nowhere near full full distribution of 5G. While they had introduced it in pockets, it was it was no near near it. But there's no question that 5G interrupts biologic communication. You know, that right. it disrupts you know fundamental ways in which oxygen interacts with red blood cells. It certainly interrupts the ways in which you know human T cells traffic and things like that. So there's no question that. 5G is a problem, but in my book, 3G was was also disruptive. 3G, right. 4G, like all of it. Mm -hmm. The microwave radiation that we have by the year 2000, long before we even had 3G, we had had you know a 10 10 to like the eighth uh, increase in in the uh, microwave radiation that is you know dictated by Bluetooth. Wi-Fi, this whole zone of, of the wireless communication network that we were developing in 2000, that was nascent, but we'd already had this billion fold increase in, in this radiation exposure to humans. Now, since then, it's another 10 to the eighth, you know, so it's, it's just a, an extraordinary explosion of micro radiation that we're exposed to. But as far as like the trigger for it, I think it's much more in the zone of microbiome shift just because the amount of role that the microbiome play versus the human cell damage. So I'm, I'm open to the, to, to the reality that 5G is playing a role in this, but as you track it across the world, it was really not the 5G rollouts, Northern Italy, uh, you know, New York, you know, uh, Louisiana, the four corners of Colorado, all of those places were not, you know, hotspots right. for 5G. Those were hotspots for PM 2.5 carbon particulate in the air. Uh, that exactly. would cause, you know, uh, poisoning of the body uh, via trafficking of cyanide from air pollution with, with the virus binding that PM 2.5. So we achieved kind of a cyanide poisoning event with, that presents with blue patients who are hypoxic and going into multi-organ failure with no signs of infection. And that's, if you read the American Journal of Medicine that, that you know, published 5,700 patients being admitted to ICUs in New York in those first couple months of COVID, they were all dying from complications of multi-organ failure presenting with hypoxia and no signs of infection. They had no fever, they had no white blood cell shifts cons consistent with a viral infection. And so we made the mistake of saying there's a viral pandemic when in fact we were seeing ecosystem poisoning happening. Was there a virus present? Yes, coronavirus was present. Was it a new strain? Yes, it was. Was that from natural causes or from military? It's, right. it's irrelevant. It happened, we had a viral thing. The virus causes headache, congestion, fever, you know, a, a, vi a viral syndrome, and nobody dies from that. The poisoning that happens when PM 2.5 carbon particulate binds to the virus and then delivers cyanide presents as histotoxic hypoxia, which is exactly what people were dying from. So we had two events related to a virus. The death was happening because of the ecosystem toxicity the virus was causing its own, you know, viral update, genetic update to the organism with the, the expected, you know, ramifications of fever, et cetera. And so just to make sure I understand you correctly. So uh, did you, are you saying that the virus actually helped deliver the poison to the body so that it was more detrimental? Yeah. So if you don't have uh, this specific line of coronavirus present, then cyanide in the air around you gets into your bloodstream at a relatively low rate. And so your, your okay. exposure to this toxin is minimal. This particular coronavirus binds to the ACE2 receptor in your lung. And the ACE2 receptor is a great entry point for PM 2.5. So when you get high amounts of this carbon particulate from air pollution to bind to a whole bunch of virus, you get a rapid trafficking of that large carbon molecule into the bloodstream. That molecule can carry an enormous amount of cyanide. So when you stopped breathing air and aerosolized cyanide and you start getting carbon bound cyanide levels that are being delivered through the, through the entry point of the virus, then you get this high poisoning event, you know, the, the, the much higher levels of, in the bloodstream. Uh, it's so interesting. I hadn't heard that piece before. Uh, I wanted to go back just briefly uh, and mention one thing when we talked about the 5G, the 3G, all that, you know, the effect, the negative effects of it. Um, I recently did an interview with a doctor, a friend of mine here in Austin, uh, Dr. Ritter, 
uh, who's an EMF, uh, an MD and also an EMF expert for the past 20 or 25 years, I forget exactly, but um, in it, he talked about some research that was done uh, in the early, uh, early 1900s, I believe, on electricity, the rollout of electricity throughout the United States and the rise in heart disease. Uh, and so, um, like you said, there's definitely an effect on all these things, electricity, Wi-Fi, all these things. Um, so even if they weren't the primary, they're still contributing to the degradation of our overall well-being and our system and our ability to deal with everything we're, you know, we, we face. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, just mention, so you talked about the microbiome, you talked about the biome and how big a role, I mean, very vast role it seems like they play. Uh, and then I just wanted to add, then there's also, um, I don't know what you'd call it, but there's the energetic component to our, to our being as well. Um, that's a whole nother layer, right? So you've got all these massive, complex, highly complex systems that are at play um, that you, like you said, are disrupting our understanding and our beliefs about you know, who we are and how simple we are. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I just find that so fascinating. Yeah, so my lab has been working for the last eight years in the area of microbiome and human cell systems in the realm of communication. So just as we've been talking about 4G and 5G, wireless communication is not new. The, the biology on planet has figured out wireless communication since our origin. We would not have been able to have multicellular life if we hadn't figured out how cells can talk between each other, even at distance. Right. And so there was multiple mechanisms by which this was achieved. One is through you know, horizontal gene transfer, which is one bacteria bumping into another bacteria and ex exchanging genetic information for gain of function and biodiversification. The other one is viruses that could send information long distances, but that's all genetic information. You have to have something that's doing second to second operational management of cell communication saying that, okay, I'm a cell over here and I have a stressor right now because I don't have enough magnesium. I need more positive electrolyte over here. So please traffic this over to me. And how do you get that cooperative right. quorum sensing intelligence that you see in fungi and bacteria? And so we've been studying that uh, and we've been extracting carbon communication networks out of fossil soils for the last eight years and studying their impact on human biology. And we, what we've been able to show is that if you take these little tiny metabolites that bacteria and fungi make when they digest food, they're, the breakdown products of their food actually create this wireless communication stream of information that we call redox chemistry. Redox chemistry is the little, literal exchange of electrons across long distances within water soluble environments. And so this exchange of electrical information is very much like a, you know, a liquid circuit board, you know, you, depending on what key you hit on your keyboard, you end up with an F or a G or whatever is on, on your screen there. That's the trafficking of electricity through lots and lots of switches and, and, and all of this. In the same way, the bacteria and fungi have created this liquid, you know, uh, living, you know, uh, CPU chip that allows for trafficking of information to happen extremely quickly, down at the millionth of a second, you know, rate of exchange of information across cell membranes and the like. And so we've been studying how do the bacteria and fungi make this, and then how does that impact human cells? And it's been fascinating because up until the moment that I started that research, all of my research had been in cancer. I was doing you know, chemotherapy development at the University of Virginia before I left that kind of inside the box, you know, you know allopathic world. But what I knew well was that, you know, uh, when you're in that uh, cellular environment, uh, the physiology of cancer or heart disease was very easy to map back to the human cell because we had only studied those diseases in the context of a sterile Petri dish. Mm -hmm. And so when I started adding the communication network of bacteria for the first time to Petri dishes, stuff started happening that I had never even imagined. I had never imagined human cells repairing themselves in a Petri dish separate from the intelligence of the body. Nobody had ever seen that before. We'd never seen cells building three-dimensional structures in Petri dishes. And so all of this was just mind blowing and then really humbling to realize, oh my God, the reason we are so up a creek without a paddle on understanding human health is because we kept studying it for a hundred years in sterile petri dishes, and we don't right. actually know how human cells work in the context of an organic garden of bacteria and fungi that are creating the wireless communication network of repair. And so it was very humbling to find out once again, human cells not at the center of human health. In fact, the microbiome is at the center of it, and it encourages 
human life to regenerate at the rate that the garden can produ can produce life. And so it was a revolution in the idea that why do we even believe in cancer? It's because we don't believe in healing. Why don't we believe in healing? Because we never studied the human body in the context of its natural ecosystem. We always studied it in isolation and therefore we made a lot of mistakes in our presumptions about heart disease, cancer, and the rest. Yeah. And it's so funny when you think about it. I mean, it's not funny. It's terribly sad, but Tragic. it's also, yeah, but it's also funny to me because it's like, it's such common sense. It's common right? sense. Like anybody who would um, evaluate something, that's the first thing you would say, like, all right, well, does it rep does it replicate the actual environment? No. Well, then it's, you know, How does it apply? <laughs> exactly. Like, it's only, it's only a piece of information. It's certainly not, you know, complete. So yeah, that, that's so, uh, so unfortunate, but it, it's obviously changing and we're making more and more discoveries and all that. Um, so uh, I wanted to come back for a minute then. So with the microbiome and the biome, oh, I, I know the other thing I want to mention is talk about disruptive. Like you said, we've been conditioned to think like bacteria is bad, like wash your hands constantly, right? And um, kill the germs with your sanitizer, your hand sanitizer. That's right. Um, and I always laugh because I think, you know, like, like Western living people are the only ones who go to somewhere like Mexico and drink the, the water and get sick, right? Everybody there drinks the water just fine. They can handle whatever's in the water. Their body can handle it, right? And yeah. so that always made me think like, wow, we're so weak in terms of our ability to handle life, human life, because we've sanitized ourselves into this little box. I mean, in particular, this last year with COVID where people were hardly leaving their homes, they're wearing their masks inside, they're sanitizing every five minutes. Uh, I mean, it's been crazy. Yeah, yeah it's, it's 30 to 40 years at best behind. Like the science that was you know, projected out of the NIH and the CDC and the WHO this year, literally 30 or 40 year old belief systems that suddenly got you know plunged out into this potent narrative and anybody who was trying to represent the current science was was censored which i couldn't even right. in those first few weeks you know I, my instagram account was taken down because i simply just published popul population statistics from china and i was like here's what's actually happening in china i didn't feel like I was being re revolutionary at all. I just said, here's some interesting data coming out of China. Right. And my Instagram got taken down. And it's just like, wait, what? Like that was very confusing those first days of, of COVID because I couldn't believe that the science community was going to be gagged as fast and thoroughly as it was because it's never been. Yeah. It, it seemed like, you know, this, this hallowed space of like science is there for the progress of knowledge and the most, the highest form of science has always been since ancient Greece dialogue that's how we met out new truths and new discoveries is through dialogue through different perspectives you have Louis Pasteur arguing with Bichamp back in France right. over is it germ theory is it terrain theory like and they they argued about that in academia for 30 years and rich stuff came out of that right and of course we kind of went down the wrong pathway we, we went ahead and said yeah it's germ theory and germs are attacking us and you know, 120 years later, we find out that no, Bichamp was exactly right, that it's the microbiome and the terrain of the immune system that actually creates resilience. And it's not because a germ attacked or did attack. Um, so we were wrong and we, and we went down the wrong route for 120 years and we're behind the eight ball by a century. But on the upside, there was a, a track record of communication between those two worlds that, that continued. You know, once Pasteur kind of went out and the, the American Medical Association was created in 1910 and we went down this big pathway of pharmaceutical development and antibiotics by 1940 yeah. and we went down all that pathway, it, it didn't prevent the osteopaths and, and some of these, you know, anthroposophical medicine. There's all these fields of medicine that I, were still embracing the terrain philosophy and continue to advance that knowledge and science over time. And so while there was huge disagreement and there was a dominant paradigm, there didn't seem to be the need to crush the, the alternative viewpoint, you know, and certainly there was efforts to, to silence it in some ways, but what happened in the last year is, is certainly dumbfounding. Certainly if we're going to have dogma, it should not be in the world of science. You know, right. science is not a body of knowledge, which I think is mistaken all the time. Like, well, the science proves this or science, you know, supports this or that. Science is literally a, a process. Science is a verb. It's the process of inquiry. Right. There's not scientific discoveries. There's, there's scientific observations that then inform the next question. 
but we're never done discovering. Like, it, you know, when you say I discovered something in science and make it sound like you're, you found the dinosaur bone sitting there in dirt and you say, here's a dinosaur bone. That's not how it works. And, and, you know, the, the biologic sciences, biochemistry and everything else, we make an observation in physics or biology or biochemistry. We say, here's an observation. Here's a, here's a potential narrative or a potential rationale for the, that observation. But that's a continuous thing. And it's a continuous revolution, evolution of, of the knowledge base. And it's not a set thing. So as soon as somebody comes in and says, this is how it works. And this is the immune system. We have, this is the spike protein that it, you don't need. Nobody knows. Nobody hell knows. And now, of course, you know, last week we, we find out, well, actually, science knows that the spike protein is a potent toxin of the vascular system. And we're now genetically engineering humanity through this vaccine program to produce a vascular toxin. Maybe that's not a good idea. And we, we hear scientists saying, well, we didn't know that was going to happen. We thought it was going to stay in the shoulder. Like, wait, yeah, right. <laughs> thought it was going to stay in the shoulder. Like, how are we going to develop immune system response if it stayed in the shoulder tissue? Like, right. it's just like very smart, educated people are making dramatically, you know, erroneous conclusions or are building erroneous narratives because they're not listening to the last 30 years of science that says the human body is an organic garden. It is teeming with life. If we go in muck with that relationship and we try to be heavy handed micromanaging our relationship to the virome or the microbiome, we're going to screw it up because we've just through a glass darkly glimpsed this reality. We have no idea how to deal with the complexity of 40,000 species of bacteria interacting with the human gut lining or the immune system or the blood brain barrier. It's too complicated. We, we don't have the computing power yet to actually even ask the interesting questions about proteomics or metabolomics or all these new fields of medicine that have just begun to be asked the right questions for. And so it's just amazing the hubris that has been exercised at these large regulatory bodies of the WHO, CDC, NIH, and the rest. So, so it's a fascinating year that we've lived through. And I think it harkens back to periods of massive governmental abuse of science and suppression of knowledge in ancient Greece and ancient Rome and ancient, you know, during the, during the Renaissance and the rest that we've covered. Through all history, we've gone through periods of this, certainly right. in the 1930s and leading up to World War II, there was you know, that kind of abuse is being uh, met out in, in Germany and the like. So mm -hmm. very we, cyclical. We, we repeat these patterns of, of uh, abusive censorship and a loss of scientific dialogue at the moment that somebody's trying to usurp a, a scientific narrative for power, for yeah. money or power. It's interesting that the universe is definitely... Um forces evolution in a cyclical nature, right? Just like you, you just described the cycles, um, but also going back to like science and dogma, it, you know, it's interesting, um, you're right, the scientific process, right? Like you said, it's a process uh, when done objectively and with as little bias as is possible uh, is wonderful. I mean, it's revolutionary, uh, transforms so many things. But what I've noticed is, often many scientists are not objective. They have their belief and they're gonna prove their belief, right? Uh, right. And so, so I think one of the things we have to really do is we have to, uh, in the scientific community, is we have to identify those that are objective and support their work, right? Those who are willing to say, I don't know, but yeah. I wanna know, and I'm gonna do the experimentation and I'm gonna to try to figure it out. And even if I think I figure it out, I'm prepared to be wrong the very next day, right? That's yep. me. Uh, but I know we're all designed differently. Some people are more capable of objectivity and others not so much. But what I feel like is there's such a lack of object objectivity in most researchers and they're heavily biased, right? Uh, and then there's the money and the control, like you said, big pharma and the funding, like who's paying for all this research, right? Well, that's a big factor. And you know, it used to be the, you know, the curious guy you know, becomes a scientist and he tries to figure things out. And, you know, there wasn't this heavy influence of money uh, behind the research. And now it's, you know, it's billions or trillions of dollars between um, all the different types of medicines. And, you know, I just heard nine new billionaires this year were created because of these recent vaccines, uh, which is, you know, I'm all for people making money if you're doing it in a way where you're causing no harm to humans and no harm to the planet. But that's certainly not the case with these vaccines. Um, 
And as you said, who knows what long-term effects are gonna be as a result of all these uh, people receiving vaccines and not only on them, but on everybody else around them. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting uh, and yeah. concerning. <laughs> Yeah, the, it is concerning. I, I, if somebody wants to do the really deep dive on this, I did a three-hour um, lecture that's free on my website uh, called GMO, Engineering uh, Nature Out of Humanity. And I do a 30-year look at the, the field of genetic engineering, starting with the initial uh, advent of genetically modified seeds for corn and soybeans back in the 1990s, and then take you all the way to the current vaccine uh, genetic engineering technologies and how We've advanced, you know, to CRISPR and all of these incredible technologies. And along that route, we discovered exactly how the immune system interacts with the genome of the viruses. And instead of embracing that, we turned that into patented intellectual property and called it CRISPR and said, we're going to start editing the genome instead of right. the amazing reality of like, oh my God, we are in contact with 10 to the 30 viruses in our air. That's 10 million times more than our stars in the entire universe are the viruses I'm breathing on a, throughout my life. There are 10 not, to not, eight. Not, not me, I've got my mask. That's right, <laughs> right. Yeah, and so, you know, it, it, there's just so many massive misperceptions. There's 10 to the eight viruses in my bloodstream right this second. And so when somebody comes along and says, oh my God, you tested positive for coronavirus. Right. It's like, well, it's like saying I, I found one of the needles in the haystack of, of right. life within you. Like, it's like, that is such a ludicrous finding. And so we have to, to realize that when somebody comes along and says there's you know, rumors of wars or wars happening in your body for all these viruses, we need to step back and say, wait, these viruses have literally been with all of life on, on, on the planet since our origins, how we right. have created life. More than 50% of the genes that are inserted into the human genome were directly inserted by viruses. Another 40% were inserted by horizontal gene transfer between bacteria and human cells. And so we're 90% virus and bacteria in, in construction. And now we've vilified right, you know, right. every bacteria on the planet. So we got antimicrobial, this antibacterial soaps and blah, blah, blah. And now we're vilified the viruses. This is literally the communication network of life. And we have vilified it and we're now attacking it. What do you think is going to happen to humanity when we attack the foundations of life? It's not going to last long. We're going to die. Yeah. And I remember early in discovering your work, uh, one of the things that resonated was your view about disease in general, how, you know, we, we tend to view in medicine, you know, each disease as this separate specific thing. Uh, again, it's an attacker, it's an invader. Ah, oh, it's AIDS, it's, it's coming into my body uh, or whatever it is, uh, rather than this more holistic understanding based on the actual science of how uh, disease manifests in the body when, as you said earlier, when things are not uh, in balance, um, and when there's, yeah. you know, all these all these um, things that are throwing the body out of balance. So HIV and AIDS is such a good example of it. Um, Luke Montagnier is the guy who won the Nobel Prize for discovering HIV, and he recently reached out to my lab to ask if we could help get an herbal supplement on the market that he had proved could, you know, completely correct the coronavirus syndrome and all of this. And so, you know, um, he's now in his 80s and, and, you know, so this guy is, you know, 40 years from his discovery of, you know, uh, the, you know, being part of that group, discovering the AIDS epidemic in the 1981 and then by 1991, you know, discovering HIV as, as the agent there and all that. And so that 10 years let us down <clears throat> this new belief system that we could have these new pandemics that would turn to endemic or a you know, disease that would be entrenched within humanity. But in the last five years, we've had to completely revamp it, but it didn't change the, the narrative on HIV and AIDS yet. But the, the new science is that we can track the, the HIV virus all the way back as far as we have American blood bank, which is to 1959, and we can find HIV in the, in, the, in the blood bank of 1959. Wow. So HIV didn't appear in 1981, which is what we were told. We were saying, right. oh, here's this like Caribbean population that traveled from Africa and then, you know, through shipping and they got the virus maybe in South Africa and they moved to Caribbean and then they went to San Francisco. And so they start drawing the dots of how this virus spread just exactly how CDC this year says, right. oh, the virus started here in Benin and this guy flew to mm -hmm. Seattle and he started this. And they create this huge narrative of these points of belief that the virus has only traveled because of airplanes. When in fact, the viruses have been traveling globally since long before humans existed. 
Right. <laughs> when somebody says there's a pandemic, it's like, oh God, well, of course, it, thank God there's pandemics. If we didn't have viruses that could travel around the world and update the genomics of the planet, we would not have life on earth. Right. And so there's this hubris that we must be the agent of change. In the same way, you know, revolutionizing our idea around HIV, we have to come to terms with the fact that the entire AIDS syndrome is not caused by HIV in the sense that Kaposi sarcoma and all these, you know, cancers, the lymphomas, leukemias that happen in AIDS are caused by herpes viruses, not by HIV. If HIV was really the causative agent of AIDS, then we could give HIV to humans or simians and expect AIDS to occur. We never were able to prove that. We've done innumerable you know, clinical trials trying to get rats, rabbits, monkeys to get AIDS, and we've never been able to reproduce that result. And so there's some sort of perfect storm that happens when AIDS occurs, and HIV is part of that spectrum of Right. of you know imbalance that occurs but it's not the causative agent which we keep making this mistake of and so when you say somebody died of coronavirus no they didn't they died of a perfect storm of dysfunction within their immune system that led to a cascade of events and by the time they died they had been clear of coronavirus for months you know and so the coronavirus will typically be in the bloodstream at high enough levels to create an immune response for three days they don't even show up in the icus until weeks later you know and so it's and I would, really I would add to that, uh, I, I would just add to that the poor care that so many received when they were feeling sick, like my uncle, as an example, in New York, died in a hospital in Long Island, because they put him on a ventilator, like so many other people, when they didn't give him anything that he needed, you know, like the hydroxychloroquine and the zinc and various things to support the immune system. Uh, instead, it was that storyline narrative, oh, this is the treatment, you know, um, and actually this is interesting, I don't know if you've heard this, but uh, I follow um, these two, two scientists and um, they revealed the document that the FDA um, published for the emergency use uh, authorization for the vaccines. And yeah. in it, what it says is that the only way they can give emergency use for any vaccine ever is if there are no other alternative treatments that are That's working. Cool. And so that is, of course, why they said the hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin didn't work, even, right. though they, even though they've proven over and over to work to various degrees at various points in time, I understand. But yep. uh, I used it personally myself, the hydroxychloroquine, and was better in four to five days. And, ivermectin uh, even faster. Ivermectin is like a friggin' slam dunk. Yeah, right. so you're exactly right. They had to keep this narrative going so that there was no treatment for this so they could get vaccines on the market. They had to hurry up and get vaccines on the market by January of 2021 because they knew this entire pandemic was going to be over by June of 2021. So right. they had to slam this thing in so fast that it would give the appearance that the vaccines were part of the solution. When right, in fact, exactly. every coronavirus you know pandemic that we've had, SARS in 2001, two, uh, MERS in 2011-12, both of those lasted for two years and then were gone. No vaccine, no anything because we always land in a homeostasis with whatever new virus comes in. That's the whole design. That's the right, purpose right. of viruses. That's the purpose of our response to viruses is we always come into homeostasis with this new genetic information. So, uh, you know, yeah, I was yeah. saying that as early as you know March of last year, like every podcast I was on, like, don't believe it when they come along in, in next year and say that there's some vaccine that's going to, it's going to go away in June, July of 2000. 2001 and if they are 2021 and if they say that it's not then they've cooked up some new story right, and right. they're measuring some new virus that isn't the current one it's got to be a different one because the current one has to be gone and now that's of course what's happened the last four months oh it's new variants and blah blah mm -hmm. blah and you're going to need new vaccines because of those variants are going to demand this and so basically we just opened up pandora's box of saying okay we're willing as a population to be genetic engineered with emergency use untested unsafe yeah. vaccines Mm -hmm. And therefore, go ahead, just give us the next one, you know, like we, we're going to, you know, do this. And so it's, it's an extraordinary mistake that we've made, not because I believe the vaccine is the worst thing that you can do to your body. I, I'm terrified of the consequences that can happen downstream in the next three generations of what happens is a really frightening idea. But even in the acute phase, I'm more concerned about the civil liberties piece of like, if we're going to sign away our human health to pharmaceutical oh, medical, yeah. you know, me medical military complex, then we have lost the whole underpinnings of our country. We, we have lost our fundamental freedoms at a, at a really profound level. 
which was foreseen ironically by, by Benjamin Rush, uh, one of the founding fathers, he insisted to Thomas Jefferson that a clause on, on, on health sovereignty be included in the constitution because in his, in his quote from the you know, late 1700s, he said, if we do not put in a clause on health sovereignty, someday some elite group of small group of human people will commandeer the science community to roll out some sort of technology that controls the health of others. Yeah. And, and, and like he described it in 1700, exactly what would happen today because he saw health sovereignty as being a critical fundamental human right that wasn't being talked about and included in the constitution. So we came this close to having something in the constitution that would do it. And, and they, they gave a nod to it with, you know, the pursuit of health, liberty, and, you know, freedom was in there, you know, or life, liberty, and freedom or whatever they used there. But so yeah, they it, gave a nod to the concept of, of sovereignty at the health level, but it never got written in as Benjamin Rush saw necessary. It reminds me of a quote by Rudolf Steiner, um, which I think he made in like 1920s, maybe, um, <clears throat> uh, about he, how he first saw science and medicine trying to remove or detach consciousness from the human so that you have this highly controllable human uh, slave, if you will, uh, because a highly conscious and connected human would be too aware to accept you know, atrocities uh, against them. You know? Slavery. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in various forms, you know, it doesn't have to be the, the old fashioned, you know, way that people perceive slavery as like African American people doing manual labor in fields, which is of course terrible, but there's so many other forms of slavery as well, in addition to that. And uh, yeah, I think he made that statement in the 40s, if I'm not mistaken, and okay. contemporary with um, you know, he uh, and uh, J.R. Rodale were kind of two sides of that coin that really become pertinent today because J.R. Dale was saying that human health equals soil health at the time. Um, and so in the 1940s, we have this sudden realization that soil health and the food nutrients and all of that was a continuum with human health at the same time that, that Steiner is making the observations around consciousness and self-identity. And yeah. perhaps not coincidentally, my lab in the last five years has uncovered that that communication network from bacteria and fungi is the is the element of nature that creates self-identity at the cellular level so human cell self-identity comes from a cell cell communication event from the microbiome that we would find in the soil air water systems food systems that we consume mm -hmm. and so it's a beautiful marriage of steiner's work and i mean jr rodale's work to find out that whoa without the strong communication network of the redox chemistry of the microbiome we start to lose the tight junctions, the proteins that hold the gut lining together, the blood brain barrier together, the kidney tubules together. And when we start to get leak across those critical boundary events in the human body, we literally are losing our self identity. And so we start mm, to wow. react to everything in our environment. And so what we find is when we take these soil, you know, substrates uh, as a dietary supplement that you take orally, it's a liquid, drink it three times a day with your meals, as soon as you drink this liquid, this communication network, your cells start making tons of tight junctions, gap junctions, all of the cell-cell communication starts to happen. And within weeks and months after starting the product, we find people resilient at the, at the consciousness level, major depression lifting, all of this. And we now know that the microbiome is you know, responsible for you know, inspiring 90% of the serotonin made in the body is the interaction of bacteria in contact with the enteric endocrine cells within your gut lining. And so this dance between self-identity and neurotransmitter production that's happening entirely from the microbiome is giving people back their sense of self. And, you know, it took me a couple of years in clinic to realize what was happening because, you know, at first, you know, I'm just like tracking inflammation markers and disease right, right. markers. And I'm like, oh my God, everybody's healing. And what the hell is going on? This is so cool. And we're giving just bottles and bottles of this dirt liquid that we're sucking out of, you know, uh, fossil soils. And like, I was, had a Sharpie marker and one tablespoon, three times a day, here you go, drink this. And we were just like blowing our minds over what was happening clinically in our basic science lab. And it was just like, what the hell is going on? Blah, blah, blah. And we we're so excited about our disease impact that we weren't thinking about health and consciousness and the ramifications there. But again and again in my clinic, 12 months, 18 months into taking the, the, the liquid, we'd have you know women coming in, in just in tears, giving me these giant hugs of like, Zach, you won't believe what just happened. Like 
I just walked out of my marriage, my abusive marriage of 30 years. And I finally just realized I deserve better than this. And I walked away and I am free and, you know, I'm doing this or that, or some guy comes in two hours later. Oh my gosh, Zach, big hug. My life has been transformed. I just quit my job. I just started the little company I've always wanted to start. And I'm on my passion project. Another guy comes in farmer. Oh my God, doctor, I gotta tell you like, you won't believe what happened like last week i suddenly found myself up in the like highest top corner of my attic pulling out you know uh, wasp nests and all of this only to, to realize that it's the first time i've ever been able to be in an attic because i was born with severe claustrophobia and have always been afraid of tight spaces and i had subconsciously just gone and done this thing in the tightest little corner of my house and my claustrophobia is gone another guy comes in i was fear of, afraid of heights and then i find myself on a 30-foot extension ladder cleaning out my gutters and what the hell is in this stuff i you know why why are these fears and phobias going away? It's because your self-identity is starting to really consolidate around your experience which is just fascinating to me that your worldview is actually nursemaided it's it's cared for and nurtured by this rich organic garden in around your body and it's a beautiful journey that we've had to recognize exactly what you're talking about steiner's work which is consciousness is the result of a a, a coherent ecosystem working in concert the symphony of life within you isolation and this is the second law of thermodynamics which is one of the most proved elements of physics which is any system in isolation increases its entropy which is a word for chaos right and so that holds true for this human belief, whether it be in a Petri dish or in the human that's now told they should wear a mask and hide at home and not touch anybody and get no hugs and not talk to right. anyone, not be touched by another human being. That isolation has increased the entropy and likelihood of them getting disease. And so I saw this you know, happen in, in my own family members, you know, get sequestered into in New York into a COVID hotel, you know, because they got exposed to somebody and now oh, geez, you got exposed and we're going to go put you in this hotel. You know, crappy, you know, temperature control. They're cold for days, no access to food or sunlight. Right, they're right. being fed three times a day, packaged foods and all of this. And then by day eight, they suddenly have a fever and they're told they have coronavirus. And OK, well, you just sequester them in a hotel with a bunch of other people with coronavirus and took away sunlight, human touch, everything you oh, isolated right. them. They For have sure. to manifest this this chaos, you know, yeah. and so it's just this amazing process that we've we've done exactly the opposite thing, whether it be the masks, the sequestration, and, and uh, social distancing, uh, the the behavior we've done in the ICUs that we mentioned, you know, the attack of uh, the microbiome. You know, we need to sterilize everything in airplanes. No, no, stop freaking spraying bleach everywhere. That's why right. we're freaking dying. You know, exactly. it's just like. We are in this isolation hubris of like this narcissism of like it's us or them. We need to kill all of them so we can survive the pandemic. Like, dude, you just no. That's right. Well, that's a year old belief. Like, stop it. <laughs> and and like you said, or you alluded to it earlier, it's like people think they are smarter than the universe. Right? Yeah. They're smarter than Mother Nature. They're you know they're going to overpower. Gonna manage this. Yeah, they're going to overpower Mother Nature and the universe and teach it who's boss. Right? We're going to kill those germs. That's yeah. right. Yeah. It, yeah, it's so foolish. It, it reminds me of what you talked about earlier: science in a petri dish, and be like, yeah, we figured it out. Yeah. Yeah, we figured out humans in a little plastic dish. Sterile <laughs> dish right here. This is how a kidney works. Yeah. Well, well, uh, I know we're actually just running out of time. Um, but uh, this has been amazing. I know we've been all over the place, covered lots of lots of different territory, but it's been awesome, uh, super insightful. I really appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing all of your deep, uh, really deep knowledge into health and uh, health and medicine. And uh, it's been it's been awesome. I really appreciate it. It's awesome to be here. Appreciate you, Jesse. Yeah. So for everybody listening, if you want to check out uh, Dr. Zach's work, uh, it's um, zachbushmd.com. Right. Yep. That's, it. That's where you're going to find all my educational content. If you go to the knowledge page, you'll find the Global Health Education uh, Summit series that I started last year at the beginning of COVID, realizing that we needed a different you know, way of expressing you know, scientific knowledge to the public. Uh, my first one was called the Virome. It gives you an hour and a half detail of what viruses are, why we need to stop fearing them, why they're important critical pieces of your biology. Um, 
Uh, there's uh, one that I did in January called What Happened Last Year. I do a, a three hour deep dive on the public health statistics of what actually happened over the last 20 years and why this year was not an anomaly. This was actually a normal year of, of respiratory death and how they managed to tell us it was you know, some sort of excess death. And I show you that and all that. So what happened last year? And then the most recent one last month uh, was GMO, uh, Engineering Nature Out of Humanity that I mentioned earlier. And that's a three hour expose on genetic engineering and the technologies therein. Uh, but we also have interlaced with that critical building blocks of how to do the opposite, how to be healthy. And the first one we did was sleep. Uh, the unifying feature of uh, coronavirus syndrome was that people were lacking sleep in the week before that they got the syndrome. So lack of sleep seems to be public health risk number one. Uh, then we go into detail about uh, vitamin D and sunlight, a number of other things and a couple of them. Uh, this next one is really exciting. Uh, the one we're doing in a week, uh, next week is on the brain. So every month we do another one of these big summits on either a health subject. We did an amazing one on death and dying and, and uh, reframing death as rebirth and how if we lose the fear of death, we actually gain this extraordinary access into life unknown. Uh, and so uh, that one has five experts uh, on that panel, a couple of death doulas and all of this, the just mind blowing stories around death, dying, and rebirth inside the body and outside of life. Uh, so just a beautiful expose there. So ZachBushMD.com there for all that content. Um, also, uh, IonBiome.com is uh, all the soil science that I was talking about earlier with the liquid supplements, if you need to go there. And so, uh, but you guys will find yourself around uh, to different content that I've done. You know, yeah, well, 350 well, different podcasts, all that, if you want to do deeper dives. Yeah, we'll also provide links to everything that you've just mentioned as well. Oh, perfect. Great. Yeah, yeah. I was actually looking, and I was going to mention some of those um, deep dive summits that you just mentioned. So thanks for bringing those up because I was looking at those earlier today in preparation for our conversation, and I was like, oh, this this looks like amazing content here. So yeah, yeah. yeah you got you got to mark out some time because I, I tend to to run deep and and long, but it's life-changing information. Um, I, I would say, you know, the virome, the GMO one, and the, what happened last year in public health statistics will completely change your frame of reference of what's happening right now and why, why you can immediately lose fear and start to live with a, a much higher intention for, for a thrive state. Yeah, and so important, like uh, oftentimes um, the depth is important. Depth of information is necessary to kind of shift your understanding. And, uh, and I just want to come back to what I started with early at the start of our conversation about being open-minded and not being um, rigidly attached to your current beliefs because um, it's, it's a danger. A uh, great book on the subject real quick I'll just mention is um, The Five Levels of Attachment uh, by mm -hmm. Dom Miguel Ruiz Jr. And uh, excellent book if anybody wants to explore self-growth and beliefs in general. But he just you know, talks about how there's these different layers or levels of attachment and how the more attached you are, the more detrimental it is to you, to you, your well-being, and the people in your life. Um, and he gives many yeah. great examples. And uh, so, yeah, I would just encourage everybody to to dive deep with you uh, because you've got some amazing research, amazing work, uh, and amazing insights that people can really benefit from and uh, transform transform their lives with. Awesome. So, yeah, so, so again, I really appreciate you and uh, I'd love to have you on again and, and go deeper into uh, some of these other topics at some point. Awesome, glad to be with you, Jesse and the audience. Uh, best of health to all of you. So glad you all showed up right now at the tipping point of all things.